Welcome back to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Cressy, and this is episode 146. I'm excited for today's guest because it's actually an athlete that I knew in his high school years through some Team USA involvement, and then we kind of lost track of each other for a few years. He was a first-round pick, um, got to pro ball, and had Tommy John surgery, and um, it was interesting to reconvene with him and just see how he had kind of worked to find his way, um, and really had a big breakout year in 2022 as he learned uh, who he was as a pitcher, rediscovered some of the things that had really made him successful when he was younger. Um, just a really good example of a guy who's evolved as the, the level of play has advanced. Um, so I think he's a really articulate guy who reflects on it well, and this will be a great podcast that will benefit a lot of players, coaches, and parents. So enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Athletic Greens, the most comprehensive NSF certified for sport daily nutritional supplement I've ever tried. With so many stressors in life, it's difficult to maintain effective nutritional habits and give our bodies the nutrients they need to thrive. As a father of three young kids and a co-founder of multiple businesses in multiple states, on top of still being an avid exerciser, I know that busy schedules can really take their toll on us. Whether it's poor sleep, exercise or life stressors, environmental factors, or simply not eating enough of the right foods, we can wind up deficient nutritionally. This is where Athletic Greens can really help. It's a game-changing nutritional insurance policy. They simplify the logistics of getting optimal nutrition on a daily basis by giving you just one thing with all the best things. And that's why I use it daily and recommend it to our athletes. One scoop of Athletic Greens contains 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients, including a multivitamin, multimineral, probiotic, green superfood blend, and more. They work together to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet, increase energy and focus, aid in digestion, recovery, and supporting of a healthy immune system. This all can happen without taking multiple products. While most nutritional products come to market and stay stagnant, Athletic Greens continues to obsessively improve this one holistic formula based on the latest research, producing 53 improvements over the last decade. They invest in the most absorbable and natural source of each ingredient and go above and beyond in third-party testing to ensure their customers continue to receive the highest quality and best daily nutritional habit on the planet. It's lifestyle friendly, whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, and contains less than one gram of sugar without compromising on taste. They put 75 ingredients to the NSF for Sport certification to come up with a formula that's trusted by some of the world's best athletes, including our own. Right now, Athletic Greens is giving our listeners 10 free travel packets with their subscription. Simply go to athleticgreens.com backslash Cressy to receive my offer. These travel packs are perfect for supporting your immune system, energy, and gut health when you're traveling for games, training, or simply when you're on the go. They can be a great counterbalance to less than ideal on the road food options. So if you want to bridge the gap between deficient and optimal and give yourself the best chance to get nutrient diversity, then head to athleticgreens.com backslash Cressy and get your 10 free travel packets today. Again, that's athleticgreens.com backslash Cressy, C-R-E-S-S-E-Y. Today's guest is a left-handed pitcher who was born and raised in Alabama. After a standout high school career that included both All-American honors and pitching for Team USA's 18U national team as it won the World Cup in 2015, he was selected 7th overall in the 2016 MLB draft by the Marlins. He made his professional debut the following spring, but underwent Tommy John surgery after only four starts. He returned to make 21 starts across the minor leagues in 2019, and in 2020, he was called to the big leagues for his MLB debut. He made seven starts for the Marlins in 2021, but 17 in 2022 as he established himself as a big league regular. At the time of this recording, over 27 major league appearances, he's thrown 129 innings with 130 strikeouts and 48 walks alongside a 4.10 ERA. Please welcome to the show, Braxton Garrett. Brax, thanks so much for joining the show. This is long overdue and I appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. I'm glad to come on. I think we always start these podcasts with the discussion on the developmental side, because so many people think that big leaguers are just born. Um, and in reality, you know, you didn't, you didn't come out of the womb ready to go right to a major league mound. You, you had a long developmental run. Were you a multi-sport athlete? Like what are the, what are the you know, kind of backgrounds and sports participation, excuse me, sports participation that you think really helped get you to where you are? Yeah. So I played all sports, football and basketball. That is football mainly. And, but I quit football after I, I broke my left hand um, and basketball after I realized it wasn't my, it wasn't my best bet. Um, but I think most of my development came from just being around my brothers and my dad growing up more so than, you know, the recreational sports. What were the age gaps on your brothers? Like how far apart were you guys? 
So my oldest brother, we're all two years apart, basically. Okay. Um, my oldest brother's 29. Storm's 27. I'm 25. Zane is 23 now. It's a pretty Give competitive household. I, I think there's something to be said. I think there's a ton of younger Absolutely. brothers in the big leagues. I don't think there are a lot of older brothers in the big leagues, but there's lots of younger brothers. Yeah, I, I would uh, get behind that just how we were in our house. Um, so, so I'm actually curious, like uh, you're one of the interesting examples is, is often we have guys that that come to us or, or really parents that come to us, dads that will often say, you know, I've, I've taken my son as far as I can. Like he doesn't listen to me anymore or I just, you know, I don't have the skill set to help him as he becomes a more advanced you know, athlete. Your dad was a coach for an extended period of time for you all the way through your senior in high school when you were first round pick. I'm just curious, like whether, you know, how did it play out? Were there, were there actual complexities in the relationship? Did you guys have kind of like some, some good unwritten rules that you've helped kind of like govern your interactions in that regard? Yeah. I mean, my dad was great. Uh, I basically, I mean, my development growing up was all my dad. Um, we were always in the backyard. I mean, he coached when I was younger as well, with my older brothers. Um, we were in the backyard. We were very mechanic-oriented, repeating mechanics. Um, he loved using Greg Maddox and Tom Glavin as examples. Um, it, we were a hit, hit our spot and nothing else household, really. But as I got older, he was never overbearing. He didn't care if other people coached me. I played travel ball at East Cobb and, you know, he, he always told me to, you know, trust my instincts mostly when it came to getting better and, you know, just my development. But the East Cobb coaches, Gary Baldwin, Kevin Baldwin were awesome as well. But that's what my dad was good at. He was good at trusting me and trusting other coaches. And he just, he never wanted to be around anyone. He just wanted to be in center field away watching me but then come high school time you know it it was me and him absolutely um you know one of the things that you know where we first met was honestly in like national team trials with team usa if you were 17 it was the summer before your senior year and um you know obviously you were one of the, the 20 guys that selected for team usa and you're frankly you're probably our, our number one starter on that team i remember watching you you know throw the first game against taiwan and you know internationally in a in like kind of an inner squad and then obviously kind of opened up the world cup for us you know speak to that experience for me because I, I know that was i mean that was some dudes right that was you know his first overall pick in mickey moniac was a second overall pick in hunter green ian anderson was on that team as a third overall pick he went seventh i, I mean i want to say like two-thirds of those guys wound up being first day draft guys um speak to that experience maybe, maybe mm -hmm. how you you know, how, what did it teach you? How did it develop you as you, as you kind of look back on, on, you know, that, you know, I guess two months of, of development. Yeah. That, uh, the, the team USA experience I tell everyone was just the best. One of the most amazing things I could have ever done. Um, and growing up, I, I didn't really know anything about team USA or, you know, their whole program. I never thought it was even attainable just, you know, uh, some random guy from Alabama, you know. <laughs> so it was a blessing to me, even just being invited to Tournament of Stars. Um, and I just, the, the way that I was, I was so naive. I just, I didn't really know how good I was. Um, I just loved to compete with teammates at East Cobb. And when I got the um, invite to Tournament of Stars, you know, I'm ecstatic, but nervous as all get out because I don't even know if I can play with these guys really because I never have you know so you know making that team the whole trials were just incredible and it's a confidence booster you know you're like man look at this like I can just keep making the cut and you know every every single cut we is a such a nerve-wracking experience um but developmental wise you know getting to work with you was a blessing all of our coaches we're incredible, you know, but um, we had to mature. We weren't a super mature group, but we had to mature, you know, a little bit being together for so long and, you know, that travel. We didn't know each other. We're all from different areas, and that's kind of how pro ball is, you know. You got to learn to get along with these guys, you know, every year. It's a new group. So, you know, I think it helped with that. Um but overall, just the competitiveness, um, 
you know, we're thinking we're playing against the other best 18 year olds in the world and we're wanting to whoop their butt, you know, so that is, it's, it's hard to explain the competitive yeah. fire that, you know, I had, and I know all of the other guys had to just play, getting to play for that team and bringing a world, you know, that gold medal back. It was incredible. Yeah. I, you know, I think the thing it's, it, it accelerates what you get in pro ball, right? You walk into pro ball and all of a sudden you look around and it's like, holy cow, every guy here is the best player in the history of their town. Like you don't, you don't ever grasp that if you're, if you're like a kid that didn't play team USA, like you, you've actually got to get to pro ball and experience it. Maybe there's a little bit on like the showcase circuit and all that, but um, like, there's so much like you, you can get away with throwing 89 mile an hour fast balls against, you know, down the d middle against guys who have, you know, no, no capacity to hit it in like high school ball in Alabama, but you go mm -hmm. and you do that against right. the Will Benson or, you know, Hagen Danner or some of the guys that were on that roster. It's, it's an absolutely different experience. Like, did you, did you have to learn how to pitch differently? Um, we, know, we know like, you know, internationally, like a lot of the teams from the far East tend to be very contact oriented, a lot more small ball, things like that. You know, were there specific like entities that, you know, underneath your like kind of skill set that you feel like developed the most? Yeah. I mean, I just think that playing against those players brought out the best in me and mm -hmm. my, just my competitive level just turned up a notch. Um, and it's kind of, like I said, it's a confidence booster when you're getting to play against these guys and having some success. So for me, just uh, that confidence that I got from them, you know, getting to face them was huge. Yeah. And I don't think you get, you, you don't get to pitch in front of 20,000 people in, in high school ball in America. You know, you get to do it at a really special right. game, a gold medal game in Japan. So, you know, it, it probably was something that from a scouting standpoint, you know, allowed, you know, teams to kind of appreciate, you know, how you would handle the big stage even better. Right. And, you know, at that time, I don't even know how much I was thinking of, you know, the Japanese guys being good contact guys or mm – -hmm you know, our American hitters, some being power strikeout guys, yeah. some being contact at that time, man, I was just trying to throw in my best stuff and yeah. see what they can do with it. You know, I knew I had a good curveball, and I knew I had pretty good fastball command. So I was, I was just a, here's my best stuff, man. Let's, let's see it. I mean, that's kind but of like, now, you know, yeah. it's very different than showcase you know, ball, you know, it's nowadays everybody just wants to go throw 98 to the backstop, but like it's a very different experience. Absolutely. I, I wish we would create that more for kids nowadays. Like, a, you know, there's this, this mindset of actually competing when you're being evaluated. Right. And, you know, I've, that's just how I've always been. I've had to grow a little, uh, a lot as, especially as I've gotten to the big league level of learning how to pitch. Um, that goes without saying, obviously, but, you know, growing up, I was just a compete guy. Um, mm -hmm. And like you said, I wish we saw it more, but it's just so analytic now. And we got 11 year olds on the track, man. And I'm not saying there's, <laughs> there's anything wrong with that, but it's just completely different than what, what I came up doing. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of pressure on high school draft picks, you know, obviously particularly first rounders, you know, what were the, the biggest adjustments that you had to make as you, as you transitioned to pro ball after that, that following year when you were selected? Um, I, th I think mostly it was just trying to develop a routine and figure out the best way to get through a full season. Um, early on, you know, I, I had Tommy John a, a month and a half into my first full season. So um, that was obviously a different experience than most. I didn't really get to compete until 2019. Um, so, yeah, just developing that routine. Um, you know, once we started back, I, like I said, I wasn't used to a full season. You know, I, I got to work with you finally, um, that first off season back. And I think that was the bit, uh, the biggest change that I made. I learned, you know, how to take care of my shoulder and my arm fully, um, my body, how to eat better. Um, I still don't do that very well, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I know how. To We're all it. works in progress. Um, Right. But, you know, just uh, learning to take care of my body better was a huge thing. I'd say for sure. Um, talk, talk to me about what you learned. I mean, obviously you spoke to like, you know, big picture of like, 
you know, learning to establish routines as you came back from that. But let's maybe talk about the actual Tommy John process. Um, you know, were there, were there specific lessons that you picked up that, you know, you would give to players who are going through it, um, you know, particularly in your situation, right? Being a first round pick and having it right away, there's a lot of pressure to, you know, not have hiccups to come back smoothly. Like if you could go back in time, like were there, were there things that in hindsight really would have benefited you to hear? Yeah, well, like you said, I, it's it's different when you get it, you know, younger, I think, than obviously when you get it older because you just have so much more knowledge of guys who have had it and, um, you know, just experience in the game, right? But I didn't have that. Um, and I would just – I would really say to reach out to people that they trust, um, guys like you, um, guys in the field that have a ton of experience – and get advice from them on just what to do going forward. Because like I said, I, just, I really didn't have a clue. I had never even been hurt before. Um, but in the process, it's just such a repetitive process. It gets boring. Um, you got to find a good group, I think, is the, is the biggest thing. Find a good group who um, motivate you, that make you want to get after it every day, even when it, you're doing the same stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's the biggest part. Just having a good group um, and finding a hobby too. <laughs> you get done with you get done with rehab, um, rehabbing your arm at ten o'clock sometimes, eleven a.m. And you got the rest of the day. Find a good hobby that you can do that you can take your mind off of the game, take your mind off your arm for a little bit. Because there's just from a lot of guys. <laughs> yeah, obviously, like I said, healthy. I, I would have loved to have been able to just go out and golf, but obviously you can't do yeah. that um, at the beginning. But you just develop something that's healthy and can take your mind away just for a little bit. Because it's a as much as we all talk about the physical, the physical parts that go with it. It's it's mentally really tough, you know. Yeah. So it's good to take your mind away. You became an elite right-handed ping pong player, as I recall. <laughs> yes, I did. CSP you know, champion I, at one like, point. <laughs> that's right. And that's, that's to uh, my dad and my brother's credit, too. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm a, you know I'm right-handed, yeah. dominantly, so I didn't have to learn it right-handed. Um, but I was just free range. My left arm would just hang, and I can kind of like <laughs> Forrest Gump. I'll just play right off the, off the table, but... It worked out right. Um, you know, another one I would say for you, whether you even recognize it or not, like Jordan Holloway, right? You guys had Tommy John the same day. Um, you basically had basically, like a, yeah. a Tommy John buddy throughout the entire process to go through every step. So I, I think that's such a, a huge thing is like finding guys that are rehabbing at the same times as you so that you can actually bounce ideas off of each other, commiserate. Um, go through the highs and the lows, you know, together. I think that goes a really long way. What did, what did Jordan kind of mean for you to that process? Oh, Jordan was huge. He, I mean, he was the one rock, man. He was always yeah. there, him and our other buddy, Stephen Farnworth. Um, me and Farney actually had it the same day, and Jordan mm -hmm. had it five days before. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, man, we were, we were going through the same thing, and uh, he was just a guy I got to lean on and, you know, let some – complaints out as as he would do me you know as well yeah. but um yeah just like i said you got to find that good group find guys who are motivated and have the same goals um i think it's just is the most important thing yeah. so let's fast forward that was that was 2019 um you know 2020 major major league, uh, major league debut during the the covid year and then 21 got, you know, much, much more time in the big leagues. But it really wasn't probably until this year where you really established yourself as like a true big league regular. You know, talk to me. I know we've had a million discussions about kind of the reasons why that's the case. But, you know, when you look back, what was the biggest step forward to, to make you a, a big league starter in 2022? Um, well, first was um, the work that we did in the offseason after 2021. 2021 to me was probably one of the worst years I've had and where my confidence was the lowest. And that next off season was so huge going into it. And, um, you know, me and cap, we, we worked on, you know, fixing my posture. Everyone noticed I lowered my arm a little bit, the arm slot. 
it was just more natural. It seemed every year I was just getting higher and higher. Um, so yeah, we just fixed that, fixed the posture. Everything came out natural. And at, once we did that, I, I had to see it in games, you know, mm-hmm. it, it was huge from, it was, I was proud of myself, you know, when you go through revamps like that, it's not pretty at first and it doesn't feel good. You know, I, I would lower my arm slot, whatever it was an inch, you know, and I told Cap and Elmire and them, I said, I feel like I'm throwing like Tanner Houck across my body, you know, sidearm guy, but he shows me the video and it's, you know, barely anything. Um, so me just trusting that and taking it into the year and, I saw success with it. Um, I did tinker with a slider grip. Um, I think I was like a two, three weeks into the season maybe. Um, and that was huge. And once, once I just started to have success, the confidence belt, um, I started to understand my delivery more. And once the confidence built, I, I started to learn you know, how to use my pitches with, you know, Mel Stoudemire Mm -hmm. in Miami, who was, you know, really, really important with my development this year, especially just learning to pitch. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I think just the biggest thing was obviously the mechanical changes, um, the confidence that came with it it was huge for me, Mm -hmm. um, for sure. And like we've talked about, man, I, when I was younger, I, I was so competitive, so fiery. And for a long time, I, I felt like I lost that for a little bit. And, you know, I think I just had to see some success. And once that came, you know, the, I just felt like me again, you know, yeah. and I've just been able to build on that. I'm, I'm actually really curious as a follow-up question. I, I, I know the answer, but I think it's a good one for our listeners to hear is there's, there's obviously a lot of talk about, about changing an arm action, right? Um, and I think historically that's referred to guys who like, you know, really aggressively wrap or take the ball really, really long to center field. Um, and they talk a lot about like, you know, being inside 90 at, you know, at layback. But I think for you, it's interesting because you, you actually wanted to bring your arm action down, um, which is a very different discussion. Um, so my, my question for you is, was it, was it a function of just getting more athletic with your drill work, playing more catch athletically, not thinking as much about where your arm was? Was it a hip loading thing? Were you actually thinking about your arm? What were the avenues that you took? Because it feels like a dramatic overcorrection, right? You just you just said you felt like you were throwing sidearm, and in reality, you brought your you know your vertical release height down by a, by about an inch. What were the the cues that allowed you to find you know that was the right fit for you? Um, what you said, uh, just being athletic. You know, when I mm-hmm. when I move my feet and you know throw a med ball, I throw it. Real natural, with the arm down, and I started to do infield throws, you know, kind of like I'm turning a double play, just being athletic because I got away from that uh, for a while, which I think was a huge factor of um, why I was so good when I was younger. I was just athletic. I, I played everything, and I didn't think ever about what I was doing. Um, but, yeah, getting more athletic, and so I'm kind of visual. So – I, like I, I say, I dropped my arm, but really, my delivery was so arched back, yeah. you know, here. And when really, I just engaged my core a little bit better, fixed my posture, and naturally, my arm is just going to come down. Yeah. A little more and of a hip so load. Long, I was always just trying to throw hard. Right, a little more of a hip load. I was always trying to just be super healy, and then mm-hmm. this way, and this way. Yeah. And that just wasn't me. I Like I said, I was trying to do it more and more, and I would just get higher and higher and higher yeah. and more this, more arch back. So, you know, just tried to engage my core more, um, have more direction this way instead of this way, um, because it was just what was natural to me. Like you yeah. said, it's a little different than most. Um, but I give credit to uh, Cap for that, Brian Kaplan. He he told he uh, suggested it to me and at that point i was looking for something man <laughs> so uh we did it and we we committed to it it was great yeah i think one of the things as a good rule of thumb is it when you add a hip load when you get a little bit more hingy it's generally going to lower 
like the arm action a little bit. When you get a little bit more up tempo, it's usually going to going to climb a little bit. So, um, you know, you're you're a grid candidate for a guy whose maybe direction was a little bit off, and finding just a little bit of right. a better like linear path to the plate made a big difference. Um, you know what I love that you just hinted at. We've we've had some good conversations just this off season. We trained about it is. You talked about med ball work, and, and I think people overlook just how good an opportunity that is to train a lot of the sequencing that you're you're kind of alluding to without actually stressing your arm, right? You can train your hip load. You can, you can do it off a slant board and find the slope. You can actively work into your front hip really, really well. Like, it seems like you're creating more context with your your movements in the gym to actually relate them to what you do on, on, the, on the mound probably more than you ever, have, you know, have been before. Am I, am I putting words in your mouth or is that accurate? No, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I've told you I've been loving the med ball work this this year. And, um, you know, the overhead med ball slam is easily my favorite thing to do in the gym. Um, but, yeah, you know, towards the end of the year, I, like we said, I, I changed the delivery a bit and I'm slightly a little more inside my line than I've used than I'm used to. So I was constantly over, you know, that right hip you know, glue area a ton. And I started to have a little bit of trouble um, towards the end of the year, getting over, getting over it and getting the fastball, the glove side. Um, So, yeah, what, you know, obviously, you know, we've been just training, getting over that front hip, getting comfortable doing it, you know, over and over again and just being able to do it. You know, I, we didn't, we didn't specifically talk about that last year because it just wasn't something that I was doing consistently. So, yeah, and I love med ball work because it's just a time to be athletic and base. I, I feel it as pitching movements, yeah. as you said, coming off the slant board and getting over that front hip is, I, for me, uh, really important. We interrupt this episode with a quick reminder that this podcast is brought to you by Athletic Greens. It's an NSF certified all-in-one superfood supplement with 75 whole food source ingredients designed to support your body's nutritional needs. I use this product daily and a ton of our athletes do as well. Head to athleticgreens.com backslash Cressy and claim my special offer today for 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. I'd encourage you to give it a shot too, especially because of this great offer and because it gives you peace of mind knowing that you're covering all your nutritional bases. Again, that's athleticgreens.com backslash Cressy, C-R-E-S-S-E-Y to get that special offer. I like it. So now that the delivery was a little bit more of where you needed to be, you, you kind of join an, an elite group of MLB guys who who throw both two and four seam fastballs that are, you know, they're heavily differentiated in like their movement profiles, but you're throwing them in roughly equal percentages. Obviously there's, you know, going to be different scenarios, righties versus lefties where you use each, but maybe talk to me a little bit about the mentality on both um, because there are a lot of pitchers that struggle to differentiate the two. You see like the spin axis blending together, you know, like do you have different thought processes for your, for your four seam and your two seam beyond just the, the grip? Um, with my four seam, I, the thought mostly, you know, I throw it mostly, um, glove side, you know, I, I love to get it in on righties hands. I love to dot it down and away on lefties. Um, so with the four seam, I, I just really think of getting over that front hip, still staying behind the ball and, you know, finishing just because sometimes, when I'm getting trying to get over to that glove side, I'd like, I'll, you know, bail out a tad with the front shoulder and and the ball will start running on me, you know, Mm -hmm. similar to my uh, two seam sinker. So just staying behind it and finishing and, you know, getting it all the way there um, is a thought with the four seam and the, the sinker has just been, it just started to come out a lot more natural with that lower arm slot. Mm -hmm. Um, It feels good, you know, I'm off to the side, you know, getting to feel that ball off the, just coming off the side of my fingers. It's just, it was a real feel pitch for me, really. Um, but the main thought with both of them is just the location. I, the sinker, I have to get it in on the lefties. The four seam, I have to get it up and in on righties. Um, so not a, t- not a ton of thought, but just... <laughs> keeping them different, different, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think you you talked about it is the arm action kind of takes care of it with the sinker, but with a four seam, like the the lower half kind of delivers you to the positions you need to get to. Right. I I think that's important. Um, Maybe touch me just a little bit like the, 
you know, in season training and throwing routines, like you talked a lot about the need to establish a routine early when we got going with this conversation, you know, do, do you have a really, you know, a uh, regimented five day routine yet? I mean, I, I know this is obviously new to you and you're having your first kind of run in the big leagues this year. Um, you know, what is a, what is a five day routine on both training and throwing look like for you? Yes. So the pat this past year, um, so for the first time, uh, Mel Stoudemire, uh, he's a proponent of saving bullets for the most part. And I've done a lot better job this year of not feeling like I have to be so aggressive and catch play all the time, because that's just how I like to be when I'm throwing, I want to, I want to throw it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, after start day, day one, I, I wasn't throwing. Um, it was just, that was my hardest, you know, run day, put a little length of some type of pole variation, um, running wise and lifting was a, a lower body explosive day, stuff like that. Uh, and big arm care, you know, shoulder care program. I couldn't tell you all the exercises. I, I had them all on a sheet. Yeah. Um, the Marlins put together for yeah. me. It was great. Um, but yeah, a uh, day one's a heavy day. Day two, um, throwing is still pretty light. I get to 90, 120, just depending on, um, how I'm feeling, um, spin light. Um, but still, uh, running still pretty heavy. I like to sprint mostly, um, just different types of sprint variations. You would know them better than me, but you know, just keeping it fresh, not doing the same type of running every set day of the year. Um, but I'm a, so day three, I'm a, Day three pin guy. Mm -hmm. um, I like to keep it, which another thing that Mel helped. I always just never thought it was good enough. My talking about my bullpen, I always like yeah. to throw too many pitches, and we really honed that down this year. I learned to really lock in and focus and get what I need to get out of eighteen to twenty pitches max, really, um, just to stay fresh. Just because it's a long season. Um, that was an adjustment I had to make, like I said, just loving to throw and wanting to stay on the mound during my bullpen. Um, but that's more of an upper body day in the, in the, um, weight room mm -hmm. with, with some more, you know, mobility and things like that. Um, day before the starts, pretty, pretty chill. We're, uh, just sprints, maybe some ladder work, something agility wise, something like that. So um, wake up, move around day. Yeah, and you know, lock in the mechanics and the spin, and get everything locked in in the grass, and treat the body good. I like it. Um, all right, so maybe build on that, you know. And obviously, it's it, it's a it's a work in progress, right? It's one of those ones that you know, oh over, yeah, over eighty innings might be a lot different over one hundred eighty innings, and you just you learn to adjust, like like all these guys have. But you know, what do you think takes you to the next level? Like, what are you working on day in and day out that you know you think is going to differentiate even further as a as a big league regular? Um, just continuing to get stronger. Um, like I said, I think our med ball work, getting comfortable, getting over that front hip, uh, is huge for me. Um, on the mound, it's just refining. Um, I'm not, you know, I've, I've got my delivery delivery. Thankfully there's no, uh, need to change and do any of that. So we're building on that. Um, I just, just continuing to be able to get my, my pitches over the glove side, I think is the biggest thing. <clears throat> yep. Excuse me. Um, the four seam and the two seam being specific with their locations um, and the change up. I think the change up is really the biggest thing on the mound that I, uh, not, I'm not changing my grip or trying to make it nastier. I just uh, need to make it more part of my game and, getting it in certain areas, I think is huge. That's awesome, man. Um, so we always do a lightning round on the tail end of each question. And, and I'm actually genuinely curious about, about this first one the most is who do, who do you like to watch and why? And, and I'm, I'm especially curious because of the, the new arm action, if your favorite guys to watch have actually adjusted over the course of time. Uh, you know, you sent me this question and I thought, I thought you typed, what do I like to watch? Like show? It makes way more sense than you <laughs> You can tell me your uh, favorite show, too. <laughs> well, Breaking Bad, by far, is my favorite <laughs> show I've watched. Um, 
Duly but noted. Clayton, Clayton <laughs> Kershaw was my yeah. was my hero. <laughs> yeah. Clayton Kershaw is my guy. Um, because back then I was a little higher. I had the mm-hmm. big curveball mm-hmm. and the four seam, and you know, Kershaw started to throw the slider a little more as I think the game you know, kind of changed, turned into more of a slider game. But I loved his big curveball. I thought I could do exactly what he could do. Um, so I really modeled after him. That's but now, one. there are so many guys now. Um, and, you know, Sh- I love Scherzer. Scherzer mm. is my dad's favorite. Um, okay. You know, I love Max, too. Uh, mm. um, but, you know, he's just a freaking dog, man. Like I said, yeah. I, I grew up my dad taught competitiveness mm-hmm. and that is, you know, that guy to a T. So I love, yeah. you know, my it's dad, a little, it's a little it different seeing it, seeing it day to day versus just on TV, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Very different. But my, my dad said a couple of years ago that really, uh, sat with me. He was like, just comparing uh, Max to everybody else. He said, Max doesn't have better stuff than, everybody else like he has the same stuff but what makes him so good what makes him the a top three pitcher ever it's what's in his mind man he just when a guy steps in the box he he knows he's better you know and he and he's i just think there's a lot to that sounds pretty sad good good lesson for braxton garrett circa 2021 right <laughs> right some of the stuff you touched on earlier um all right this i feel like i've already given this softball on this one but favorite teammate of all time and why you you mentioned Will Benson. Yeah, oh, um, that's a good one. That's my guy. Um, obviously, Jordan Holloway. I was the best man yeah. at his wedding. He'll be the yeah. best the, the best man at mine. That is my favorite pro teammate. Yeah. Um, but Will those Benson, two, those Team USA. Uh, for guys that don't know, he's with uh, Cleveland Indians. Just just absolute angel of a human. Um, most positive and a, guy and an absolute I've ever been mo- absolute monster as well. He was yeah. He's one of the more put together athletes I've ever seen in high school. No doubt, because we you know we played with the East Cobb Astros together too. Mm-hmm. So um, that was just an awesome experience when we when we both made Team USA um, and got to do that together too. I that was awesome. I got a couple uh, really cool pictures of me and Will at home in Alabama when we were celebrating. But yeah, was, two that, two great gem gems of guys that no doubt right on um all right so last one advice for a teenage braxton garrett if you could go back in time and confer some wisdom on uh on 16 year old you what would you say to never lose the competitive edge you know ever you know like i said i i felt like i lost it there for for maybe a year or two and Man, I would say never do it. The business of the game and, you know, the just the job-like feel of the game, I feel will take it away from people, but never lose it, man. I, that competitive edge. I think that's, you know, and, and you talked about Scherzer briefly on this, but that's something you can train. You know, I think people think you either have it or you don't. Baseball can train it out of you, but you can you can harness it by finding ways – you know, I think you, you know, you, you watch what like Michael Jordan did in his documentaries is like finding grudges against teammates that, you know, weren't even realistic. He just created them in his mind to like take him to another level. Like I think we've certainly seen Max do that a lot. And I think there's something he said. I wish I wish more guys honestly would take advantage of like some of the mental skills stuff that's available on those resources to kind of like capitalize that because um, it is a really important message. Absolutely. Yeah, I if you got to make it personal in your head, make it personal, whatever you got to do. Um, yeah, I, I've harped on it enough. You know, I just that being competitive and uh, just having conviction and everything that you do, there is absolutely something behind that. Somewhere Sean Cole is applauding. <laughs> yeah. So, pre- yeah. Previous Sean guest. Cole. So he, Sean was the, the man responsible for selecting that national team is now in, in San Diego doing his thing. So, yeah. um, but hey, Brax, this is awesome, man. Folks can find you on both Twitter and Instagram. It's at Brax Garrett. Um, you're a treat to have around the facility, man. An absolute stud. Excited to see you do your thing in the big leagues. Finally, you put a lot of work in to get there and future is very, very bright. So thanks for taking the time. Uh-huh.